Hello, I'm Jay Hirsch, Director of Administration of Columbia's ERM program. I'd like to welcome you to today's ERM panel, COVID-19 Impact on Systemically Important Financial Market Utilities and Global Financial Markets. Before we start, I'd like to tell you about some upcoming events from the ERM program. On November 12th, we're going to have our first in our CRO Spotlight Series with BNP Paribas CRO, Lloyd Plenty. On November 18th, we're going to have a panel on privacy and cross-border jurisdictions. And on December 3rd, we'll have a panel on conduct risk, the consequences of bad behavior. And now for opening remarks, I'd like to pass it on to Bob Kostakopoulos, the Deputy Academic Director and Lecturer in the ERM program. Bob. Greetings. Thank you, Jay, for the nice introduction. Uh, on behalf of Founder and Academic Director, Sim Sigal, I welcome you all to today's urgent and topical panel. Panels are an important and popular co-curricular co activity in our ERM program. We hold about eight panels a year in person or virtual. Now, financial market utilities, FMUs, or central counterparties, CCPs, uh, are the perennial trusted third parties in our financial system. Without the FMUs, money does not flow from buyers to sellers, assets do not flow from sellers to buyers, financial institutions cannot intermediate, and markets cease to function. Despite their large impact on the economy, the probability of failure of a central counterparty is quite small. As a result, the risk is defined as probability times impact is also low. In other words, FMUs reduce the systemic risk in the financial system in the view of the regulators and the markets. Of course, with this uh, important impact of, uh, on the economy uh, comes with stringent uh, regulatory oversight, which includes uh, stress testing for the systemically important uh, FMUs, just as it is for the globally important systemic banks. Uh, banks. Um, well, a, a very interesting topic, so we're looking forward to it. Without further delay, I would like to introduce the moderator, Dr. Michael Librak. Michael is a lecturer in the ERM program, head of counterparty credit risk and systemic risk at Depository Trust uh, Clearing Corp, uh, DTCC, one of the oldest and biggest uh, central counterparties. We thank Michael uh, Librak for assembling this sterling group of panelists for our benefit. It is now my pleasure to present Dr. Librak to you. Michael, please take the podium. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction, Bob. I really appreciate it. And I'm very excited to be part of this event. Um, as you said, we have a fabulous uh, panel here tonight, um, some of which I work very closely with. And you know, I'll start off by introducing John Fennell. He's currently the Executive Vice President and Chief Risk Officer for the Options Clearing Court, uh, responsible for implementing the firm's risk strategy, including ERM, model risk, security services, business continuity, and third-party risk management. Next, we have Sharon Haas, who's the Global Head of Resiliency Strategy, Regulatory and Governance at BNY Mellon, another critical company in the industry. And as you can see, Sharon has very broad responsibilities uh, regarding resilience and regulatory practices. Next, we have one of my colleagues at DTCC, David LaFalce, um, we work quite closely with on the topic we'll be talking about tonight. Um, we both co-run a COVID-19 uh, response group that we'll talk about. Um, David is the Managing Director and Global Head of Business Continuity and Resilience uh, for DTCC, and he's been with the company for, for many years. And last but not least, uh, we have Raj Ramanath, uh, the Executive Director CIB Clearinghouse Risk Strategy at J.P. Morgan Chase. And Raj has a wide range of responsibilities looking at uh, C, uh, CCPs. And I work closely with Raj as well in connection with 
a risk advisory council that DPC manages. So again, I want to welcome and thank all, all the panelists uh, for being here tonight. So with that, uh, we'll start off with our questions. Um, this will be for all of our panelists, and we'll, we're going to start off with, with uh, John first. The pandemic uh, clearly took the world and the financial sector by surprise. Uh, you know, what was the biggest challenge you faced uh, in your role within your organization, particularly during the first couple of months of the crisis when the markets were extremely volatile? Yeah, thanks, Mike, and really great being here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, so last spring was really the perfect storm for us. Uh, we started off with severe market volatility. We experienced record transaction volumes and, and, and doing all this under our business continuity plans with all of our employees working remotely. I'd say that while we, you practice your operating under your business continuity plans, you're always curious to see if it's really going to work as, as you planned. Uh, is the infrastructure going to work? Is it scalable? What are the risks that are emerging given the prolonged nature of the pandemic? Uh, can we run all the processes, especially those emerging processes that run infrequently, like our default management processes? Uh, those are all the questions you, you walk into as you operate on your business continuity plan. And as we settled in, we really discovered that, you know, our remote working environment was quite resilient. Um, in some instances, we did need to modify how we worked. Uh, then we saw that more as a function of kind of the prolonged nature of working remotely. So how are we collaborating with our other employees? How are we hiring and interviewing and continuing with our workforce planning? Um, and, and so those are some of the things we, we modified as we went through the process. Um, we also started to shift our thinking about our employees infrastructure. So we were less concerned about our uh, our office infrastructure and, and do we have employees who have a concentration on a particular internet service provider and if that, what happens if that goes out? Power was another issue. So we started thinking about resiliency issues from that perspective. And then I'd say last, we also um, began to test some of those processes that only run once in a while, but we wanted to make sure uh, that they work not only with our own staff, but also other stakeholders in the markets, right? The central counterparties are really kind of in the middle. And so they don't work without, you know, dependencies on exchange processes, other clearing members and other service providers. So we want to make sure that we are ready, not just uh, our own firm, but as, as the markets. Thanks, John. Appreciate that. And, and Raj, how about yourself from uh, your role at JP Morgan? Thanks, Mike. So happy to cover that. So I think uh, uh, John touched upon some of the aspects of this particular pandemic. Uh, I would probably touch upon the interpersonal aspects first before talking about the technical skills. So uh, again, to John's point, the pandemic spread very quickly, like any other natural disaster. One day you were at office working, the next day you were told to start working from home, except that unlike what you were previously tested for or had experienced in terms of, let's say, a storm where at max, it's a couple of days and then you're back in office. This has been extremely prolonged. So I think eight months out, we are still working from home. Several of us might continue to do so for a while to come. And so from that perspective, I think it introduces uh, aspects that you probably never thought about or taken for granted. So for example, working from home sounds very attractive and you're doing it on a one-off basis. But when you're doing it on an ongoing basis, little practical things like, oh, do I have a desk space? Is somebody working out of the kitchen table? Uh, do they have a second monitor, a keyboard? Little things like that can make a lot of difference. Uh, there was a lot of adaptation required from the perspective of technology, uh, where previously you would just walk to somebody's desk and speak to them. Now you had to make sure you were familiar with a whole lot of new applications, whether it's Zoom, whether it's Jabber, whether it's BlueJeans, a whole lot of new applications out there that you had to make sure you had access to, got comfortable with, and started using proactively. Managing teams is another area that I would probably say was not uh, was something that you take for granted in BAU. Uh, when you have junior staff on your team and you want to have a conversation with them, you swing by their desk or you meet them near the coffee machine or the water cooler and you're having conversations about how things can progress. And now you had to make sure you're consciously setting up meetings and inviting them if only to listen so that they can grow. And then last but not the least, being sensitive to the fact that people are working from home and therefore they need flexibility, whether it's flexibility in terms of the hours of the day that they're working, whether it's I don't know, they're working different days, some days of the week, but not others. And the fact that they're dealing with, they're staying cooped up inside a condo, can't necessarily go out worried about their family and making sure that from a mental health perspective, they're all doing fine. So that's definitely uh, the, past, the aspect I would say was probably the biggest challenge. 
And then from a technical perspective, I would probably say as risk managers, uh, benign market environments, good times, uh, things are lovely. Uh, the real test for a risk manager comes in when uh, the stress hits the market. And that's when you really have to make sure that your decisions were right. You're constantly monitoring the portfolio. You're in, uh, in touch with all your counterparties and you have a pulse of the market. And thinking about risk across all the various risk stripes, making sure you were connected with all your counterparties and at the same time, making sure you had the pulse in place was probably the biggest challenge from a technical perspective. Thanks for those perspectives, Raj. You're hearing a lot of great points. I think a lot of us are facing, um, you know, one in particular that um, made, made me think, which is the fact that uh, you, as risk managers, especially someone who's coming up, maybe a more junior person, you don't learn nearly as much in benign, quiet times as you do during the challenging time. But that's a great point. Uh, Sharon, over to you. you know, your company is, is very similar in some ways to an FMU and provide a lot of critical services, but you know, personally, what have you seen as the biggest challenges uh, so far? So thank you, Mike. And uh, again, thank you for having me here tonight. I appreciate it. Um, I, well, I would echo what my, um, my colleagues have already said. So maybe I'll focus on a different part of the, uh, the eight months than they focus on so as to not be quite so repetitive. In the first several weeks, um, I found that was perhaps the, you know, the most challenging in certain respects. And it was a very, very different environment than any of us had been thrown into in the past. It was beyond any testing that we had done. We had done extensive testing, but never 98% of our employees basically shifting to a work from home environment pretty much overnight. That was huge. And so the tactical challenges were trying to get information passed on to over 50,000 people in a very short period of time, getting decisions made on everything from macro issues to very, very micro issues, um, ensuring that people had the right equipment, the right connections, the right accessibility, um, as Raj said, had the ability to get on the internet and stay on the internet during a time period where, you know, probably there's never been as much demand for middle of the day bandwidth, um, particularly in, you know, some of the countries in which we operate. So the tactical challenge was really um, quite, quite formidable in the first several weeks. We, um, not all of our employees typically have the capacity to work from home. Not all of them were previously equipped, for example, with laptops and docking stations and monitors that would allow them to be comfortable in that environment for a sustained period of time. So obtaining equipment and getting it in the hands of our employees in a safe, secure manner was certainly a formidable challenge. Um, as part of that, and the shift to a completely different environment, we also recognized right up front, actually before we even made the decision to have people work from home, we understood that we were going to need to put into place different controls to ensure that we were still operating safely and soundly. So ramping up the, the controls that needed to be put into place. And again, the communication aspect of that, not only ramping them up, finalizing them, communicating them in a very clear and yet succinct manner and being very transparent about the change in the day-to-day -day BAU um, way of approaching your job was paramount to us. And, and it, it, I think in hindsight, it really helped us minimize the amount of downtime and what I call friction between working as normal in the office and shifting to working um, remotely as normal. So. Thanks, Sharon. Definitely some interesting points we're all struggling with. Um, and last but not least, David, I, I know you and I talk about these issues almost every week together, but they can share for the group sure. your biggest challenge, especially in the early days, the darkest days. So, so the interesting thing about going last is that everybody's already covered off on all of the topics that you wanted to cover off on. So I'm going to riff this a little bit because I, I have nothing novel to say here. That's on my screen. So um I was, I, when I first kind of scribed out what I was going to say, I was kind of wondering if I was going to take the counterpoint or, or if I thought that this was easy. I, I wasn't really sure. 
Um, but I will say that the financial sector in general, um, we, we've done a lot of planning on this. So whether or not you folks know that there's a full FFIEC handbook. I know we're not supposed to use acronyms, but I actually don't. John probably knows what FFIE stands for. I, I actually don't. Uh, but there's a for full Financial FFI Institutions Examination Council. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> so there's a full there's a full handbook that the government puts out about how to go ahead and and and, and have regulators and, and, and your auditors look at your pandemic planning. Uh, so in 2007, the entire sector, just about, I mean, billions of dollars were spent on this exercise. Um, uh, we had a pandemic exercise. It was kind of right in between. Uh, SARS and 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 uh, then it went SARS bird flu pig flu or swine flu sorry um, and we had a massive exercise and it was a two week long exercise and a lot of good stuff came out about that you can actually find the paper online and a lot of the things that came out uh, came out during that time helped shape what was going to um, how folks should should really plan and and it actually helped also improve a lot of the, the uh, technology providers infrastructure um, and, uh, and, it, and it helped kind of groom what individual firms, especially FMUs would, 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 would take the task as far as with planning for a pandemic. Now, the interesting component of this is that we, we did a new exercise in 2014 and then lots of people were, were, were saying internally, at least in the vocation that, that, that we're all in, hey, we can't get funding for pandemics. Nothing's happened in the 1918. We tend to forget there was one in the 60s and then there was, uh, you know, at least one in the, in the early 2000s. But um, most firms didn't, um, were starting to, the, the, the management's interest was starting to wane in pandemic planning. Um, but we did do these massive exercises that took place. Um, what I can tell you is no matter what those massive exercises are, as, as my constituents have said, it, those are two dimensional exercises. We did a lot of stuff to improve but there were still elements that, that needed to, that we needed to react to. And they've covered off on 99% of them. What I will say that, that the biggest problem I think we had was probably in the first two weeks. And in the first two weeks, we found that those individuals who feared the unknown, whether it be a positive unknown or a negative unknown or a neutral unknown, who hadn't managed folks from further than three deaths away, really had a hard time in that initial adaptation as to how do we go ahead and, and operate in this environment? And so that was, I would say that the biggest, the biggest kind of uh, uh, fervor or churn that we had was right around those personalities and adapting to this, this unknown. Now, that unknown took oh, those things that I just mentioned, but it, it, it even came down to, hey, I don't have my special office chair that I have in my office at home. So these managing those, and we're only a firm of 6,000 people, I, I'm, I'm sure that exponentially uh, Bank of New York and, uh, had, had you know, exactly that many multiplied. So these were, these were all tiny little things that echoed very loudly. Um, but it was really that fear of the unknown that, that became the biggest issue that we had to contend with within those first two weeks. Thanks, David. That was definitely a good, unique perspective. So thanks to everybody for sharing your, you know, your, your challenges on the first question. We're going to talk the next question, which we're going to pose to, to John um, regarding the FMUs specifically and their unique role. As, as Bob mentioned in his opening remarks, you know, financial market utilities are considered critical entities for the financial services industry. Um, among other things, we provide trade guarantees, margin efficiencies, trade netting. Therefore, our clients and regulators look to the FMUs to provide stability during periods of stress and crisis. So John, you know, how, how is your firm able to continue providing these critical services in the face of such extreme volatility? Yeah, thanks, Mike. So I'd say from a financial and systemic risk perspective, right, March and April were unprecedented. Uh, market volatility was the most severe since the financial crisis back in 2008. Uh, we had new challenges with this period was really kind of the prolonged nature. As Raj was saying earlier, it's, it's most shocks that we've experienced in the recent 
history where last a week would be a long shot. Now we saw a period of volatility extended multiple weeks. And that that's that's something that took us a little by surprise. Um, but but CCPs, you know, are first and foremost there to protect the confidence in the market. And I'd say it's important that our risk management frameworks are designed with, with these kind of periods in mind to stand up with, you know, these periods of real extreme volatility. But, but that said, there's a flip side that I don't know do people think about too much uh, related to these challenges that CCPs also need to be sensitive to not creating kind of liquidity and credit squeezes by having margin processes that are pro-cyclical, right? It's real easy to manage in a highly volatile environment by just going and scooping in all the money that the banks have and protecting yourself. But, but that creates pro-cyclicality, which introduces new risks. And for, for those who aren't familiar with pro-cyclicality, it really means having margin levels that scale up dramatically when volatility increases. And in extreme cases, you know, that those elevated margin levels can really become the driver to the liquidity demands and create the issues on the bank. So you're just piling on to your own systemic issues. You know, within CCPs, this is an area of real focus for us. Our models are really designed to mitigate pro-cyclicality and not add to the systemic challenges that we're already experiencing, right? Um, this is something that we're really conscious of managing during periods of extreme stress uh, during those markets. Um, I'd say finally, you know, as a foundation for secure markets, it's really important that the CCPs continue to provide those uninterrupted services to the markets from an operational perspective. Um, while our processes may be operating seamlessly, some of our third parties or our vendor relationships might not have the exact same level of operational resilience that, that we have, and they may be presented some challenges. So we really you know, took that opportunity and made sure that those vendors that were really critical to our own operations um, uh, were operating well. And then for those that were experiencing some challenges, we have contingency plans in place and we're ready to exercise those plans as well to, to mitigate those unforeseen risks. Thanks, John. And being the, the other financial risk manager from an FMU on the, uh, on the event tonight, I, I'll just chime in a bit as well there. Um, echo a lot of what you said, you know, the first you know, month or so, you know, what was extremely challenging and not anything I'd seen in you know, a number of years in terms of daily market volatility, the impact on firms and, you know, being the credit manager for DDCC, you know, that was a major challenge and, you know, kind of tying it to what John said, a first, I guess, order of mitigation in a CCP is to um, increase your margin, right? Protect your, your exposure. That's what our models, CCP models are, are largely predicated on. So, you know, we did that and there was lots of margin calls made to members and some of them were, were being stressed to, to meet those. And it was really a balancing act, right? You, you don't, you want to protect the CCP and the industry by taking the right amount of margin and, and covering your exposure. But to John's point, if you go too far, especially a firm that might be small and not have a lot of external liquidity lines in normal times it may be challenged to meet those and you could actually cause an event or a default, which is the last thing that we want to do. So it was lots of long nights, lots of, of meetings with our, our, our market risk and margin teams deciding what, what we should do about margin calls. Should we give some flexibility to firms to, to kind of help them work through those unprecedented days? So, but that said, I think, you know, overall, um, while we're still, you know, in this event, unfortunately, you know, the volatility has subsided, at least for now. Um, you know, our members, you know, have stabilized and by and large have, have gotten through the worst of the event. Um, and I think at least until this point, um, which is goes to the question I posed, you know, have FMUs been able to continue providing the services? I would say for DDCC, we have um, by and large, we, we've had very, very few incidents, we call operational incidents or member problems, um, thankfully in these first seven, eight months. Um, but again, it's, it's still unfortunately not over and you know, we hope that the volatility doesn't return, but there are also some extraneous events coming up as we all know, we have elections, we have Brexit, other things that can uh, spook the market. So it's, it's sort of an ongoing, ongoing issue. Um, I don't know if anybody else on the panel wanted to chime in on this issue before we, before we move on. This is Sharon. I, I just wanted, sorry, I just wanted to add quickly that um, everything that you just described could have happened from 
a cause other than COVID that created market volatility, right? I mean, and and you're right. I mean, the the FMU's had a lot of market till everyone had a lot of market volatility to deal with, but the the shift to people working from someplace other than their primary office didn't at least from our vantage point, did not seem to materially contribute. I mean, it may have just been, you know, that added layer, you know, so-called quote, icing on the cake. However, it was really the market volatility that was the challenge and, you know, the cause of, you know, margin calls and so on. So it's, while it's impossible to divorce the two issues, it could have happened outside of any sort of pandemic. It could have happened from any other kind of cause, which makes us, you know, obviously always on guard for it. No, that's, that's a great perspective, Sharon. Thank you. You're right. I mean, we have a stress testing program in, in my firm called Hypothetical Scenarios, and we have probably upwards of 40 or 50 scenarios, and we, we struggle to come up with what we call stress weights or how much could each of these events cause the markets to move. And in the end, a lot of them end up looking very similar, right? So it, it could be many drivers that end up with the same ultimate effect, which is a big S&P drop or yields widen significantly. So that's, that's a great point. So just moving on, we, we talked a little bit here about, um, you know, FMU's view of how, how we performed uh, so far. Um, the, the next topic or question is really around, um, you know, our clearing members of which we have two on this panel, um, Sharon and Raj, um, to get their perspectives on how they view the performance of the FMUs to date. And um, do you feel that the FMUs have the necessary uh, operational resilience to continue providing these services um, should the economic fallout of the crisis and the pandemic continue for a prolonged period of time? So maybe a start with Raj um, on this one. Sure. So I think I would echo a lot of what you and John said. So I think uh, the COVID pandemic probably provided the first true test, uh, provided the first true stress test for the financial sector after the financial crisis of the 2008. And to acknowledge and to give credit where it's due, I think after the financial crisis happened, a lot of good work has been done in the industry as a whole. Uh, there was a clearing mandate that came in, uh, which purely by way of clearing through netting and through collateralization of transactions went a significant way in terms of reducing credit risk. But on top of that, I think regulators have also been vigilant in terms of requiring enhanced standards. Uh, the supervisory stress testing that has been imposed on, uh, on FMUs, the enhanced capital and liquidity requirements that are required of members, all of them have contributed overall to the resilience of the market as a whole. And therefore, this was an interesting test to see how would the, how was that enough and have are there any lessons learned has has that uh panned out sufficiently for the market to be resilient and i'm happy to say that overall i would say that the market has been resilient and as i was thinking about this particular question i was thinking about it across all the different risk types i think uh you mentioned the market volatility the liquidity issue and i think it's, it's almost like a case study where you can think about all the different risk stripes one feeding into the other and so if i think about it from that perspective you talk about the market volatility, unprecedented, unprecedented market volatility that was seen in March, April. And that's essentially market risk. And as you rightly said, you raise margins to make sure that you are covered. And I think I would say that depending upon the institution and what the margin model was, yes, there were uh, variation margin calls to cover the PL moves based on the market volatility, but uh, the initial margin calls also varied depending upon how the models were and whether they were based on a low volatility environment and had to suddenly and quickly react to a high volatility environment. And that is probably critical because that essentially feeds into whether or not you're creating a liquidity pressure. So when there's a margin call, uh, participants need to meet that margin call using liquid assets. So it's either cash, treasuries, or highly uh, highly rated sovereign common bonds that need to be sourced in very short measure to meet those margin calls. And there was a potential for that to create a very significant liquidity pressure and a liquidity risk issue. And I think uh, two things ensure that that did not happen. So one was all the reform that was done ensuring that our clearing members were well capitalized, they were maintaining, maintaining sufficient liquidity buffers, that definitely eased the pressure. Uh, 
and to give uh, to acknowledge the action taken by the central bank. So the central bank action in terms of infusing liquidity into the market also went a long way in terms of ensuring that there was no liquidity risk that crystallized into a credit event. Because if there is a liquidity issue and a member is unable to meet the margin call, very quickly you have an instance where there's a default event. And that was something that was managed and therefore it did not translate to a credit deal. So very quickly from market risk, you go to liquidity risk and now you've reached credit risk. And from a credit perspective, I would say that all the work done has definitely paid off. Overall, the market did prove to be very resilient. Uh, when I think, and uh, my team looks at CCPs globally and I went, when, when I think across geographies, there's probably a couple of instances, one small member that defaulted in the US, a couple of small members probably in Europe, but nothing major, nothing that really shook the markets, no Lehman style default where it shook the confidence in the marketplace. And even where there was a default event, and to John's point about ability to manage the default event, it was very interesting to see CCPs had already geared up to make sure that they could manage that event remotely and make sure that they could liquidate the portfolio. So from that perspective, the credit risk was very well managed. To touch upon the operational and technology aspects, now layer on the fact that everybody was working from home. Now with this unprecedented market volatility, there was also an element of increased volumes. And depending upon the asset class, we are talking about any time between two times or three times increased volumes. I think it was a right moment for that to be an operational issue. And kudos to everyone who ensured that that did not happen. Uh, clearly, there were processing, uh, there were increased uh, volumes that had to be processed. There were some instances where there were delays and probably some settlement failures. But I think keeping communication ongoing and the channels open ensured that that, again, rather than trigger into a default event because people didn't know what was happening and there was a payment failure, it ensured that it did not result in a default event again. So I think overall the FMUs did manage well. Are there lessons learned? Possibly. And there are probably areas that we all need to think about because any crisis brings with it lessons. But uh, overall, I would say that thinking across risk types, the FMUs certainly did manage well. Thanks, Raj. Um... And uh, the other CCP member, uh, Sharon, anything you wanted to add to what Raj mentioned? Well, following Raj is a very hard position to be <laughs> in. Um, that was quite comprehensive. Um, and I, you know, I, I share a lot of uh, the great information that she's already shared with you all. Um, again, I'll take a page out of David's book that I um, have to riff here, but I would say, above and beyond everything that Raj said and take everything she said, I hope you were taking copious notes. Mm -hmm. um, the planning that was done by the institutions for a completely different purpose around, you know, ensuring constant access to their FMUs. It was mostly done in support of ensuring that should there be a bank failure, that banks would have the knowledge and the, um, the resources and the lead time to ensure that their access to FMUs could be somehow or another you know, continued. That planning process proved to be invaluable, I think. Um, and the part of it, I think that was perhaps at least um, anecdotally of most value was in having at the ready alternate phone numbers for people, um, have, knowing who their contacts were, Raj mentioned the constant communication and ensuring that um, it, it large financial institutions in particular that, um, that were responsible for you know, a very significant proportion of the volume were in constant communication with each other. So no one was caught you know, unaware or caught by surprise that something was coming their way. I think that communication aspect and, and most importantly, the contingent and alternate means of communications um, proved to be invaluable. So it kind of goes back to, you know, hope for the best, but always plan for the worst. Thanks, Sharon. I, I think you know, Raj, you're rushing on a lot of a lot of excellent points and being a bit biased with for CPP. I will obviously agree with a lot of what you both said, but I'll add a little bit too in terms of like the planning. Um, in the interest of time, I can't go through all the things that we do with ECC in terms of of planning on, on the risk side, but just to give one example, um, we do what's called a closeout simulations where a member defaults and there's a ton of work that needs to get done internally with third parties to hedge portfolios and or work with regulators. It's 
it's literally, you know, probably a hundred page document of uh, um, a roadmap. And we've been doing this, you know, for years before this event. And we even were doing this, um, my colleagues uh, primarily were doing this from home uh, before the pandemic to see, could we do something like this from home? And lo and behold, we had to do that um, as, you know, one member did, um, did need to get closed out, a small member early, early on in the crisis. So you're right, I think we both hit on planning, um, you know, plan, 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 and, you know, hope for the best, but uh, make sure you're ready. And also the significant amount you have to give the regulators, you know, some, some credit here, you know, since the credit crisis, I think one of you mentioned this, that the, uh, you know, the bar has been raised um, in terms of uh, resilience requirements on you know, the CCPs. There's something called uh, CPMI, IOSCO standards that um, were, were rolled out uh, that apply to CCPs that require we have, you know, the highest standards across financial risk, operational risk, really every risk family. So I think all that really contributed to, you know, so far, um, what's been, you know, pretty, pretty good performance from, from the FMUs. Okay, um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll shift gears slightly. Um, you know, this, this question is going to first be posed to, to David, given his role. We've talked about the impact of the pandemic to the economy, the financial markets, uh, but perhaps the most significant impact on the financial sector, including the FMUs, has been the significant shift in, in working from home. Uh, this was touched on a little bit earlier. Dave, what impact has this new model had on operational risks for DTCC and the industry at large, given your interactions? And does the current environment make the industry more susceptible, for example, to cyber attacks? So uh, let me start by saying each firm has their own idiosyncratic risk. Um, the big one from an operational risk point of view um, with the COVID overlay here that we had at DTCC was our, our physical securities processing. So from a background point of view, uh, DTCC has what I would call the vault of vaults. Um, if you wanna read some pretty good conspiracy theory, you can go look at um, DTCC and Hurricane Sandy slash vault. Uh, you'll find some interesting stuff there. But in the vault are roughly at this point in time, about $70 trillion worth of physical, physical security. So, paper securities. And they're still handled physically. There's manual processes that move them from one place to another place. So while much of the dollar value of them has been dematerialized or digitized, there's still a segment of the economy that has not been. So we had to find a way to keep this operation open while maintaining the safety of those essential workers and staff that supports them. So that's a big, that was a big undertaking um, it, it, I mean, everything from uh, rotation of staff uh, to taking basically, a, a, I don't know, 70 people at any one time and putting them over 12 floors so that they could be physically distanced um, to not taking public transit to hiring car services and Ubers and renting cars. It was an expensive undertaking. Um, and so that, that was a segment of our particular business that couldn't work from home. Layer on top of that, all of the support structure that has to go with it, which are uh, guards, uh, guards and guns, um, and um, uh, IT, and um, uh, the, the deep cleaning that has to take place. So that was, again, that, that was a segment of the economy that, that we had to, to, to keep open, um, albeit um, uh, we brought down the throughput of that area. Luckily, most other firms, that throughput, which supplies our vault was already down. So um, we're, we're back up to 100% given the, 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 the pro rata that we're operating under. Um, we're back to 100% of throughput but we're doing that with 50% of the, of, of, the, of the workers. So I'm sure each firm has a story like that. Um, that story of ours seems to have been the constant theme through the last two big uh, impacts that we've had as, a, uh, as an East Coast uh, firm, uh, Sandy and now this. Um, the other thing that I'll touch on is, is on the cyber front. I think that there's been a lot of talk about 
you know, ha- people working from home and, and, and cyber attacks and things like that. So, and John, you know, jump in on this. I, I, what we've seen is if there's just arbitrary numbers, if there's a hundred cyber attacks a day during tax time, 85 of those are labeled, click here for your IRS, blah, 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 blah. What we found at this point in time is given the, the, the overlay of COVID, the volume is still 100. It's just COVID is the tagline now for those phishing attempts. Um, so maybe 75 are COVID and, and, and uh, 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 10 are, I'm trying to do my backwards math now, 10 are, um, uh, 10 are still, we're still tax and then, you know, 15 were something else. But that's kind of the volume we've seen. So the phishing is still the same. The, the odd, the, the interesting thing about this all is, and, 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 and everybody's touched on this, is people working from home. And so we have this extended enterprise now. And we've had to issue, you know, certain guidance. But for the most part, people are operating off of VPN or VDI. So they're containerized. Um, they're using, you know, secure tunnels. There's things like that from an electronic point of view that are, 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 are fairly secure. What's old is new, right? Pandemics were old and now they're new. Paper and printing now at people's homes is the, is the new set of risks, is the new set of operational risks, is the new set of privacy risks. Because at home, at, at, at work, we have shredders and burn boxes and locks, lock containers. At home, we don't have all of those things. So, you know, you, you even get back to issuing specifications and allowances for people to go ahead and, and purchase shredders. You can't police them, but you're assuming that people are utilizing those things. So it's one of these, again, it's one of these things where an old risk has now become, um, you know, top, uh, uh, one of the top risks. Thanks, David. And I'll just add a little bit to that um, in that within DTCC and you know, David is more the expert on this, but because we've been able to you know, largely successfully work from home, um, like a lot of other firms, perhaps to you know, everyone's collective surprise, it is making us rethink our operating model for the future. David, I don't know if you, if you, without getting too detailed, maybe give a high level kind of what management's thinking, you know, or rethinking uh, for the future in terms of um, you know, our operating model. So <laughs> it's a, it's it, it listen no nobody's going back to the way they were before. Uh, I mean I, I think that there's been enough discussion. I mean giant firms are telling us they're not going back till 2022. Uh, I think it's somewhere in between whether it be on on rational fears or or irrational fears nobody's going back to the way they were before. Period. Um, there's some sort of hybrid model that lies somewhere in between zero occupation and 100% occupation. Um, what I think most of us realize during this is that we're fully functional and capable of operating from home. I, I, we, we've seen productivity go up. At, in fact, what we've seen is we're trying to pry people away from working because we're worried about burnout, which Sharon touched on before. Now, um, the hybrid environment, I don't, I don't think can be fully established just yet. Uh, I think that because of the fears that people are going to have, we're still trying to figure that out. But what we have now is a glut of, of, of black space, right? We're all sitting on frozen assets. Um, we all want to do things like microsites, whereas our microsites are going to be essentially the buildings we have now just with less, less population. Um, we're going to have people embracing hoteling a lot more than they already had. I mean, you're, you're looking at fairly old and stodgy firms on this call right here. You know, the concept of, of embracing hoteling and things like that is, is if I, when I brought this up after Sandy, you know, I, I was, what's the expression, run out on a rail. Um, but we're going to have to embrace these things. And we're going to have to embrace these things probably largely in the financial or real estate handcuffs that we're bound by right now, only because these are going to be frozen assets. And there's and most of us are signed into them for long periods of time. You know, 
you're not signing leases with companies our size for one or two years. These are 15, 25 year, year assets. If you're Bank of New York, you own the whole, you know, three quarters of Wall Street anyway. But so, um, you know, you're going to be operating out of those, those areas. I just don't know. I, I, I can't wrap my head around exactly what that's going to look like yet. I don't think we're going to have content, you know, uh, 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 strategy rooms with, with being, I, I don't think it's going to be as comfortable as it was because even if we get to the point of, uh, of either a treatment or some sort of prophylactic, I, I don't know that people are going to still be that comfortable to go into that environment. Thanks, David. Appreciate that. Okay. Um, so we've covered a lot of, a lot of different aspects of, of COVID, the crisis, you know, taking everything into account. Um, and given that nobody really knows how long, unfortunately, the pandemic or the economic fallout will last, hopefully not too long or too long. Um, what's one or two uh, key lessons at this point that you would take away or lessons learned from, from your experience? And maybe we'll, we'll start with, um, we'll start with John on that. Sure. So I'll say one of the things I'm taking away really is that, you know, when you talk to your process owners, right. And David probably knows this and you're challenging them with stress events, it's really hard for them to really acknowledge some of these extreme stress events, right. When you start pulling, you know, what we're trying to do is you put one extreme kind of stress event together with another one and then put them together and then exercise a length of time that that's really hard for them to kind of get their brains around that. And, and, you know, when you think about that, if I were to raise the, this concept, you know, 12 months ago, uh, as David, they'd be, you know, running me out of the room. But, you know, now we're experiencing it, right? We experienced working remotely in your business continuity plan for 12 to 18 months if, if, and maybe longer. Volatility that we haven't seen and how long it's happening. And, and so what, I, what, what this teaches us is really, you know, the, one, the importance of stress testing to not only thinking about financial scenarios, but those operational scenarios, and 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 then using those scenarios to understand your what your vulnerabilities are. And I can't emphasize more: stay curious about those. Don't don't argue about the likelihood of the scenario so much, but think about how can you mitigate that risk that are identified by those events, enhance your resiliency, do it now when it's cheap, uh, and you can have a very good plan that's implemented over a period of time versus only coming up with plans that are uh, developed in a fire drill type of mode. Yeah, yeah. so to, to support John on this, we've had pandemic, we've had a sandstorm that came over from the Sahara to Florida. We've had you know, the civil unrest. I, I'm sure there's some sort right. of plague coming. This is all within 2020. So take whatever scenario you've gotten for volatility or, or stress and layer a bunch of stuff on top of it just to, you know, just to play it safe. And David, you haven't even gotten to the presidential election yet. I, I <laughs> Listen, it's. <laughs> I remember the good old days when Brexit was our top concern. Yeah, right. right. We were meeting on that, you know, and, and, and the question was Johnson. Right. So that was. It. <laughs> but you both raised good points. And I particularly think John said something that resonated. Stop maybe haggling over the likelihood in my role in overseeing our hypothetical scenarios. We have working groups that try to come up with these scenarios and all, as I mentioned earlier, and we spent so much time saying, okay, we have to meet this extreme of plausible test from our regulators. What is plausible? Is this plausible? You know, and frankly, if you asked us six months ago, none of us would have ever thought this, what we're in now or eight months ago would have been plausible. So it, it really needs to, you know, have an imagination and, and just prepare for the worst, right? Hopefully it never happens, but this definitely is, has been eye-opener. Uh, you know, just reminds me of one last comment before I move on is, and I, I'd written a book a few years ago on systemic risk and the last chapter, I, I, the heading of my last chapter was, it's not a matter of if, but when, meaning there'll, there'll always be another crisis. And one of the things I said in there was, you know, here's my best estimate of what the, the next crisis might be, but it's more than likely something that we never thought up and lo and behold, Right, that that came that came true. So, all great points. Um, Sharon, well, any lesson learned you wanted to to chime in on? Yeah, I was just going to say that um, we've talked a lot about stress testing, but um, one of the things that we found most valuable was really 
um, something that we do during BAU, which is that we have the same crisis management governance structure for a mini, you know, right now, something that, you know, we would even like laugh if you called it a crisis, just for any little tiny thing that happens, we have the same structure for that as we have for, you know, a big, huge crisis. And it allows us to create muscle memory around, you know, who does what, what gets escalated to whom and on, you know, on what basis. And that's really important having separate structures and, you know, for one that, is pulled out only for black swan events. That is, um, that doesn't really serve you well when the crisis comes on really, really rapidly, like, like this one appeared to. And, you know, in hindsight, you could say that there were warnings, but when people finally woke up and said, wait a minute, this, you know, is really, really serious. At that point, there was no time to waste and you had to know exactly what you were gonna do. And it was like a fire hitting the building. You couldn't then suddenly pull out your, your plan off the shelf and say, how do I get out of here in the event of a fire? So exercising your crisis management governance system and your decision-making process and knowing who you need to reach if the first person's not available is really important to us. Thanks. No, that's, that's very interesting. Um, Raj, any, any final comments, lessons learned, takeaways? I think you and Sean hit upon stress testing. I'd probably take a twist on that in terms of focusing on models, because I think uh, we talked about margin models and kind of prosecticality that they produce. So I think as you think about models and stress testing, also look at what are the implications from a liquidity perspective. Yes, the aim is to minimize credit risk, but sort of balance it out with managing liquidity as well. Uh, and more broadly, I think making sure there's sufficient communication and transparency with market participants as a whole, and having keeping those channels of discussions open as a way to ensure that everybody's aware of what's going to come, so that everybody's prepared to deal with it. Uh, I think we've had a pretty uh, robust discussion tonight on, on the topic of FMUs and COVID. Um, hopefully. Uh, the audience uh, enjoyed it and, and learned learned a bit. I want to thank um, significantly all our panelists for taking time out of their schedules um, to, to join tonight and offer their perspectives. I want to thank uh, Jay and Bob for, for organizing this and uh, look forward to seeing everybody down the road, maybe at a future event. So thanks again to everybody um, and everybody stay safe. Take care now.